There's many tasks that we have to juggle as PhD students. First, we're running experiments or simulations and collecting data. Then we're interpreting results. We need to be spending some of our time simply thinking things through. We need to present our findings at group meetings and conferences. And for those of us in computational sciences, we might be spending a lot of time programming. We're writing up our results into manuscripts and we're writing our dissertation. We need to be staying on top of the existing literature. We also need to manage people, interact with our advisors, supervise students and work together with our colleagues. We're managing deadlines, for example, for conference submissions. And on top of all of that, we're trying to simply have a life, which should come first, but sometimes might be hard to squeeze into all of that busy schedule. In this video, I will focus on this box and I will try to help you stay on top of literature effectively. So staying on top of literature can be divided into three subtasks, finding the relevant literature, reading and learning from that literature and using the literature in your own work. So let's dive into the first subtask, finding the literature. And your main goal here is to filter what's relevant to your research in all the really massive amounts of papers that have been published thus far and are being published every month. And the first powerful thing that you can do is to follow your advisor on Google Scholar. I really recommend that you do that early on in your PhD. So you find your advisor and you simply click on this button follow and you'll see this pop-up window. And for your advisor, I recommend that you tick all of these three boxes. So you want to know about the new articles that your advisor publishes about citations to their previous work. And it's also handy to know about any articles that are similar to what your advisor has published before in the similar research area to your advisors. You then type your email address and click done. And with time, you might also find other key researchers in your discipline that you might want to follow. And for some of them, you might only want to know about their new papers being published and you might not necessarily want to know about all of the citations they are receiving. Now you can also follow yourself on Google Scholar. Uh, it's great to know who cited your work and why, so I recommend uh, ticking that box and papers that cite you are likely to be relevant to you because those papers might extend your work. Uh, so you really want to know about this and see how your work is being used. Now, once you do all that, Google will now start sending you updates once every couple of days. And it's useful to create an automatic tag for those emails just so that they are immediately categorized as coming from Google Scholar. You might also want to automatically mark those emails as read just so that the notifications don't become intrusive. Uh, because the last thing you want in your PhD is to get disturbing notifications. And instead, you might, for example, schedule the time once a week to look through the publications that uh, have been emailed to you by Google Scholar. And especially, you should pay attention to the articles that cite your advisor's past work, because those are likely to be very relevant publications that you might want to read carefully. Now, when it comes to looking for academic literature in general, uh, Google Scholar really has it all. So my only suggestion here is to always, always use the advanced search uh, button, just so that you limit your search results to the most relevant publications. Otherwise, it's very easy to drown in the sea of what's being published. So you really need to become selective when looking for relevant literature. And one example that I can show you is, let's say that I want to find papers that use autoencoders, but such papers that the autoencoders are so important in those papers that this word is actually present uh, in, the, in the paper's title. So I can limit the search by taking this option and let's say that I only want the most highly impactful papers. So I'm going to search within the journal Nature Communications. And I might even specify the dates 
for publishing if I wanted to look just for the latest uh, articles. And there's one more tip that I have for you when it comes to looking for the relevant literature. So when you have a new research idea and you want to check if something similar or even the same has already been published, you can use the advanced search uh, and include keywords that describe your idea as best as possible. So let's say that my idea is to use deep reinforcement learning to optimize long-term planning and decision-making in renewable energy systems. So I can use the advanced search and type in the keywords that are very descriptive of, of this particular research idea. And I can then see if similar works have already been done or what has been done in, in this similar area. And you might even ask ChatGPT to suggest some keywords for you. You can describe your research idea to ChatGPT and ask it to, to give you, let's say, 10 keywords that you can use in Google Scholar. And this is helpful because sometimes when you're new to the area, you might not yet know that specific term for something exists. So ChatGPT could suggest uh, those terms for you and then you can uh, look up those keywords in, in Google Scholar. And this is a great way to make sure that your idea is really novel and that you're not going to duplicate existing research. And finally, I would like to challenge you to search for interesting papers that are outside of your field, outside of your comfort zone. And you might especially focus on looking through what's being published in the best journals out there. So there's a lot of great research being published in journals like Nature, Science Cell, or the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And reading papers from those journals can be a really inspiring experience that can fuel your own way of writing and presenting your research. Uh, but it can also teach you how to construct powerful scientific arguments. Now, why do I recommend reading from those best journals like Nature or Science? Well, those papers are typically very well written. They have to be, right? Because they're published in such high quality journals. And they tend to have really amazing figures that can inspire you about clearer, more compact way of presenting your own research. So really reading papers from those journals every once in a while can teach you what the best of research uh, looks like. So now we're moving on to the second subtask, reading the literature. And your main goal here is to understand what has already been done, but also understand what is missing from the existing knowledge and still needs to be done. And in this subtask, you will roll your sleeves and read the literature that you found earlier, but you want to be reading it effectively and efficiently. So what should you take out from each paper that you read? Well, first there's three high level items that you should aim to understand from any given paper. So first, what is this paper about? How is it relevant to my research? And what, it, what is its novelty or the main contribution? And these three things you can typically get uh, just from reading the title in the abstract. And uh, based on that information, you might decide whether it's worth your time to keep reading the paper or not. And sometimes you will realize that this paper is not relevant to your research and you will decide not to read it. And that's also a very efficient decision to take sometimes. But let's say that you continue to read this paper and you now also look for any interesting methods or techniques that could be useful to you as well. And the authors might be computing something in a way that you haven't thought about before, but could benefit your work. Next, it's great if you can understand from the paper what could be the future work. And sometimes authors say that explicitly, typically in the conclusions of the paper. Sometimes they don't, and it's a good exercise for you to try to think of possible future extensions, ideally ones uh, that you yourself might be able to tackle in your PhD. And finally, you might want to note anything that you didn't understand from the paper. If there's a concept that you didn't understand, but you feel is crucial, 
you can bring that concept to the next meeting with your advisor and your advisor might be able to clarify things for you. For example, for me, that has often been some mathematical concept that I didn't understand and I could then ask my advisors to help me understand that. Now, there's plenty of software and methods to take notes on the papers you're reading, and it's really best that you find what works for you. But I use Notion to take notes on papers that I'm reading, and I have this ready template that I duplicate for each new paper. Now, Notion is really great because it lets you paste web links or screenshots and images from a PDF, and you might even create sections to explicitly write uh, what is a given paper about? How is it relevant to your research? So those are the kind of the questions that you saw on the previous slide. Um, so it's it's useful to, to have a template ready and then just duplicate it for every new publication and fill it with your notes. So my final advice here is that you keep returning to papers that you've read in the past, especially the most important papers that you've read at the beginning of your PhD. And those might be the papers written by your advisor or his previous students. And the benefit from rereading papers is that oftentimes some pieces of knowledge will only start making sense after you've done a bit of research yourself. So after you got your hands dirty with some tricky methods, you will start to appreciate some old findings in new ways. And maybe you will find that a piece of knowledge from a paper that you once just glanced over now becomes very useful in your current project. And you couldn't know that the first time you've read the paper, right? Because you still didn't have enough research experience. So some insights from earlier literature might only start to resonate with you after a few years of doing research yourself. And finally, you simply want to interrupt your forgetting curve. So in every PhD, there's a handful of really important publications whose key insights you want to have memorized quite well. And you can remind yourself of those insights by returning to those papers every once in a while. So the third and the final subtask is using the literature. So this comes after you've filtered out the relevant papers and you've absorbed their content and your main goal here is to build something new from the existing knowledge. Now, the further you are in your PhD, the more avid user of the existing literature you become. And at this point, you want to really integrate the existing findings into your own work. And here you are really building new knowledge in connection to what has been done before. So for example, there might be something odd that other researchers found and described in their work. And it could also explain what you are currently seeing in your work. And you can then formulate a hypothesis that a phenomenon from earlier publication by other authors plays a role in X, Y, and Z. You also want to stay on top of the most important methods, tools, techniques that could help in your project and using techniques and tools that others have developed saves you a lot of time. So this might, for example, be a piece of software that others have developed that solves a particular research problem that you're facing. So why not using it? By using the literature, um, uh, that way you can really save a lot of time yourself. But it can even be something as simple as, hey, that's a neat way of plotting results, right? So very often I could find some interesting way of presenting results in a figure. And that inspired me uh, to, to present my research in a similar way. So by reading the literature, you must also develop a good understanding of where the gaps in knowledge are. And then you can tap into those gaps in your own research. And remember that it can waste a lot of your and your advisor's time if you don't do this step well. And there's this uh, great quote that I found on Twitter. I really wish scholars from the 1970s would stop stealing my great new research ideas. And this is very often the case. 
uh, in research, unfortunately. So we have an idea and then we do a little bit of literature search and we find out that this has already been done, you know, decades ago. And it's great if later in your PhD, you also develop this understanding of what it is that your field really needs right now. What contribution would support your field the most right now? And this is really the way to create helpful and impactful research. So use the gaps in the existing literature to develop something new and impactful. Now, I would argue that citations are a proof that you're using the existing knowledge. So my final tip here is to be generous with citations when you're writing a paper or your dissertation. And there's a great quote by Professor Tara Brabazon that citations loan us expertise. And I absolutely love that way of looking at the existing literature because it really loans us expertise that we don't have to acquire by years and years of our own research. We can simply use the findings of the researchers before us and build on them. So when should you cite other people's work? Well, first you should cite to support your claims. So remember that any unsubstantiated claims are simply meaningless and useless in science. So for example, let's say that you write a sentence like earlier research suggests that there's no one size fits all or evidence from earlier research suggests that this and that. And if you don't add citations in sentences like that, then the question becomes, you know, which research or who suggests that? Or if you say something like the current trends indicate that, well, where are these trends reported? Or this has been studied in the past by who? or the method XYZ has often been used for this purpose. Well, who used it and is it really being used often? So who use, who often uses it? Or using XYZ is considered the default? Well, considered by who? Or this variable is typically defined as this and that. Where has it been defined like this? Or X, Y, and Z is a good heuristic to select something. Something, well, who uses that heuristic? So any sentence that looks like this should really have a citation. And uh, by giving a citation at the, at the end of a sentence like this, you let the reader verify your claims. You allow the reader to check those sources and you give the reader a chance to either agree or disagree with you by performing their own checks of the research reported in those uh, citations. So of course you should also cite when you use an existing method or when you use someone else's software. Now uh, that's just basic honesty and giving credit, but it also prevents you from plagiarism. So if you don't cite the relevant source and give an impression that you yourself have come up with a method or have developed a software, then that's plagiarism. Uh, you should also cite to point out missing knowledge. So citing literature that way can help uh, signal the novelty of your own PhD work. Now, that's a tricky one because how do you prove the existence of a gap in literature? And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. So for example, you can say that research done in one to three, in these three citations, uh, considered a method XYZ, but did not consider the method ABC, which can be relevant when blah, blah, blah. Um, so this signals a, a missing approach. Uh, and you can also say that even though such and such research has been conducted to the best of our knowledge, no study has been conducted that does this or that, or maybe such technique is not available yet. Now this signals a, a missing study uh, or, or a missing technique. Uh, and you might also find that a specific paper showed that XYZ, which now begs the question whether, you know, ABC holds as well, for example. And it often happens in research that an earlier study triggers some new questions that ought to be answered in the future. And this might be your chance to create novel work. 
You should also cite to acknowledge others' work that's close to yours. And first, not doing that can be seen as arrogance by the reviewers. But also from the perspective of someone who reads your paper, they want to find references to similar works and that helps them gain the relevant knowledge of the field. So it's useful if you cite, uh, cite the work that's, that's very close to your current work. And finally, you can consider citing to simply satisfy the reader's curiosity about a subject. So maybe there was a, a really interesting paper that played a big role uh, for you in formulating your ideas and shaping your thinking, uh, or, or one that particularly helped you understand a concept. So why not citing it? You know, your paper will likely be read by another PhD student in a similar position as you, so you might also inspire and, and help that other student it, with, with the paper that was inspiring to you. And finally, let's look at staying on top of literature from the perspective of the entire PhD. So let's see how the three, the three step tasks evolve throughout the PhD. So finding literature, reading re literature, and using the literature. So let's say that this timeline is your PhD. And this is the start of your PhD, this is the end of your PhD, and this is somewhere in the middle of your PhD. And on the vertical axis, we'll put the amount of effort that you spend on each subtask. Now, I would say that reading literature evolves like this throughout your PhD. It's heavy at the beginning, but then it decreases as you progress in your PhD. But it doesn't decrease because you're giving up on the task of reading literature. It simply decreases because you're becoming better at being selective and you know how to filter what's important to you and you know how to extract important information quickly. And also you've done your most heavy lifting in terms of reading the literature at the beginning of your PhD, right? This is when you've been reading the most important papers, typically written by your advisor and his past students. Uh, so that heavy lifting has, has already been done. Now also notice that the effort spent on reading the literature doesn't go to zero at the end of your PhD, and it never should really. So as long as you're an academic, you should always dedicate effort to reading the new literature that's emerging. Now the effort spent on using the literature might look like this. So at the beginning of your PhD, you won't be using the literature very much. This is when you're still starting off with your own research. Uh, but closer to the end of your PhD, you're becoming an avid user of the existing methods, tools, techniques, software, ideas. So you're constantly doing your own research in relation to the research done by others. But even to create your first publication, let's say somewhere in the middle of your PhD, you had to already use that much of other people's research. You were relating to that research in some way. And finally, finding research should be a steady activity that you sustain throughout your PhD and throughout your academic career, really. So you should always be on the lookout for interesting and relevant papers that can enrich your work. So I hope that with these tips, you can find a lot of inspiration in the research work done by others.